So let's take a look at our agenda here. First of all, I'm going to go over a few key points from the Making Substantial Improvement Determinations webinar that we held a couple of weeks ago because substantial damage and substantial improvements are related topics. Then I'll turn things over to Jennifer and she'll talk about the definition of substantial damage and then go through the different steps associated with making substantial damage determinations. Then I'll be talking a bit about tips and best practices for preparing for a large scale disaster and making substantial damage determinations after such a disaster. I'll talk about connections with FEMA grants and flood insurance and ways that communities can go beyond minimum national flood insurance program requirements in relation to substantial damage. Then we'll talk about some different resources that, that can assist you wrap things up. And again, we should have plenty of time for questions. And once again, I'm probably going to be using the abbreviation SD so I don't keep saying substantial damage about 100 times during this, this presentation. And I may abbreviate substantial improvement as SI. OK, so let's review a few key points related to substantial improvements and general aspects of the National Flood Insurance Program. Communities that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, adopt and enforce floodplain regulations that meet NFIP minimum requirements. The substantial improvement and substantial damage provisions that are contained in your floodplain regulations are one of those minimum requirements. The substantial improvement provision that we talked about during the last webinar, this is defined in your community's floodplain ordinance. Any proposed development located in a special flood hazard area that has been determined to be an SI must meet the applicable requirements in your community's ordinance. So that, that means meeting the same requirements that would apply for new construction in a special flood hazard area. And again, enforcement of this and all of the other minimum NFIP requirements is required for, for all participating communities. The SI and SD provisions are really the, the best opportunity for older buildings in your community to be brought up to modern flood damage resistant building standards. And that in turn reduces future flood damage in your community and keeps residents safer. So they're, they're two of the most important provisions in your floodplain ordinance. And that's, that's why we're here today talking about them. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer and she's going to talk about what substantial damage actually is and how it's defined. All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Mara. Um, so we're going to dive into the substantial damage definition. Uh, the substantial damage definition is part of um, communities that participate in the NFIP. It's part of your ordinance. Um, there is a reference in the substantial improvement definition, which I'll show on the next slide um, in regards to substantial damage. Um, but as we talked about, this is an enforcement provision that needs to be done by the community um, as part of your participation in the NFIP. All right, so we had covered substantial improvement definition in the last webinar. Um, and in, you can see in the red there, um, it does include a, um, a statement in there that this term includes structures which have incurred substantial damage regardless of the actual work performed. Um, because throughout the ordinance, you'll see it references new construction or substantial improvement. But just to note that, you know, if you're dealing with substantial damage, that is also considered substantial improvement. So um, those requirements of substantial that are required for substantial improvement also apply with substantial damage. 
And as we noted, um, there were some a couple of, of exceptions that were included in the substantial improvement, one of them being um, if if a structure is regarded as historic, um, it it can be um, it doesn't have to meet the substantial improvement requirements. And that was the term um, at the end of that definition. So that does still apply um, with substantial damage as well. So if you have a historic structure that's substantially damaged, there is the potential for that exclusion from those requirements. And again, the historic structure is a definition in the ordinance. Um, there's very specific criteria. Just because something's old doesn't necessarily make it historic. It does need to meet certain criteria and communities should be getting documentation to um, to confirm this and also to keep that on file um, with your permitting um, documentation. So the specific definition for substantial damage means damage of any origin sustained by a structure whereby the cost of restoring the structure would equal or exceed 50% of the market value of the structure before the damage occurred. So very similar to substantial improvement with the 50 comparing it to the 50% of the market value. But just remembering that you're looking at the pre-damage market values of the structure when looking at substantial damage. Um, the term any origin is also highlighted and we'll be getting more into those details because it's not just origin of flooding, it can be pretty much anything um, that happens um, that can cause damage to the structure. In Massachusetts, um, it's in the state building code that there is an additional provision regarding substantial repair of a foundation. Um, so just be aware if you're in a Massachusetts community um, that that applies. Um, and if you have any questions about that, um, we have Joy, um, Joy's contact information who's the state coordinator in Massachusetts. Um, you can follow up with her on more questions regarding this. All right, so one of the things that I forgot to mention when I was talking about the substantial damage um, definition is that this is not only included in the town, the community's floodplain ordinance, but it is also included in the 2015 um, international codes as well. And New Hampshire has adopted those, those codes. Um, so substantial improvement, substantial damage is defined in the codes in section 104 of the international building code and section 105 of the International Residential Code. So it's not just a floodplain ordinance thing. This is also included in the state building code. So just wanted to mention that before I move forward. Um, so some factors that may result in substantial damage. Um, if you do have a flooding event that causes damage, you know, if, you, if that flooding occurs above the first floor, it has an extended duration, that water is sitting there in the building for an extended amount of time, or if there's high velocity wave action, um, you're most likely looking at substantial damage. So those are just some clues that you may have a substantial damage um, determination coming on that. And as I mentioned before, damage can be of any origin. It does not need to be just flooding. If you have a structure in the special flood hazard area that is damaged as a result of the fire, um, high winds, earthquake, um, tornado. Um, it could be man-made things like a pipe burst, um, frozen pipes burst um, causes damage to the structure. Pretty much anything, if somebody needs to apply for a permit to repair something, um, they should be, you should be considering whether or not um, a substantial damage determination. And it can be a combination of factors as well. Um, here in New Hampshire, we've, um, in 2008, we had the tornado that went through um, the town of Northwood. Um, it damaged several structures around Northwood Lake. Northwood Lake has a floodplain, so some of the structures were in a floodplain. Um, so I did notify the town of Northwood to re remember about their substantial damage uh, determination because a tornado is of any origin, so they needed to make that determination there as well. Um, here in New Hampshire, we haven't had a significant flood event um, that caused a lot of damage to structures probably since 2007. Um, so it's been a long time for many community officials from having to deal with a large scale um, flooding event. Um, and Samara is gonna get more into those details um, following my section. So just a reminder of that. Um, but substantial damage can be um, kind of an everyday thing. If there's a fire 
um, like I said, if there's some kind of damage to the structure and it's in a special flood hazard area, a determination will need to be made. So you need to verify some of the responsibilities, verify if a substantial determination needs to be made. Um, remember in your ordinance, it says all proposed development in a special flood hazard area requires a permit. So you just need to be educating your residents um, your property owners about the need that if they need to be doing something with the structure, um, especially one that's in a special flood hazard, they need to be coming to the town and looking to see about a permit. Um, you know, communication is key, especially during substantial damage, especially if you have a large event. Um, communication be the, between the community and property owners is very crucial, and we'll be kind of following up on why that is. Um, you need to verify the cost of the repairs to the structure. Um, property owners are not going to be knowing what type of costs need to be included in the determination, so you need to make sure that they are including all the different types of costs that need to be um, accounted for when making that determination. You need to have an idea of what your market value of the structure is. How are you going to deal with that? Many communities in New Hampshire use the assessed value of the structure, and it's just the structure. We're not accounting for the land. Um, so you need to have that all in your head before, um, really before somebody's coming in for a permit for substantial improvement or substantial damage. Um, and then very similar to substantial improvement, you need to make a determination and it's best to document it um, for your records and for the property owner's records. Um, and then make sure that once um, you've issued, um, once you've issued that permit that they're complying with the standards of the ordinance um, and then just maintaining that documentation on file. Um, not only does our office do this, but FEMA will also go out to communities and we'll check in with you to make sure that you do have this documentation on file. So you want to make sure that you have that um, so that we can review it when we come and visit. Uh, so some of the initial steps are if you do have something, if you're aware of damage to a structure, making sure that the property owner is aware of the requirements and coming in and talking to you about um, the damage and the repairs that are needed. Um, a lot of times this is not known. I know there is a case where there was a fire in a special flood hazard area. The property owner was not aware that that even considered was considered under a substantial damage determination because the thought is, well, it's in the floodplain, it must be due to flood. Um, but again, it can be of any origin. Um, so this approach can be can vary um, drastically if you're just dealing with one house or a couple houses or if you're dealing with multiple houses. I know I worked with the town of Gosstown after the 2006 flood. Um, they had 82 structures damaged. Um, so just imagine if you have a flood event that happens suddenly and suddenly you have 82 structures you need to evaluate and make a determination on what you need to on substantial damage. Um, as a result, they had 26 structures that were substantially damaged. So those were 26 structures that they needed to permit um, and make sure that they were complying with the regulations um, needed to bring them into compliance. So um, it's good to think about this now. Again, in New Hampshire, we haven't had such a large scale event since 2007. Um, so now's the time to kind of get yourself ready because when a flood happens, a lot is happening and um, you just need to be aware of what, what your next steps are gonna be. So the one of the ways we've um, tried to help communities is we've looked around uh, the country at um, some samples of substantial improvement, substantial damage applications, and we've developed an application packet. Um, this is nothing set in stone. It's a tool made for communities to use. Um, some communities may not want to use the entire packet. Some may. Um, you may want to change things. Um, that's why we have it available on our website in a Word version is to make it um, available to you to customize specifically for your community. But we really set it up to um, account for the things that you need to be doing as part of your substantial improvement and substantial damage um, determination process. It also helps ensure fairness um, with applicants as you move through those, especially if you're dealing with multiple structures that have been substantially damaged. Um, it also helps applicants have an understanding of what they need to do as well. And it just makes it easier, again, for you to have something in place 
um, to have your documentation. Because again, you need to have documentation of your determinations on file. So this is a set up to um, really give you that documentation that you need um, already set up. So there's different parts to it. It's a, um, it's a checklist. There's an application piece to it. Um, there's a place where people can talk, um, list all the cost estimates, and it's set up to account for those things that you need to be accounting for. Um, so instead of looking at um, the guidance document to try to make sure that you have all the account, um, all the repairs that you need to be looking at, this sheet kind of um, is set up to account for all of that. And in addition, we found that um, it is good to help address the fact that property owners are going to have a lot of questions too. And to just help you answering those questions, we've also put together a property owner guide to help understand these um, substantial improvements, substantial damage um, requirements. So it's set up, um, it gives them the definitions, it gives them the resources, um, it tells them what kind of costs um, they need to be looking at. Um, and just things that they need to know. There's FAQs in there um, that kind of help walk them through the process of what they need to submit to the community and why the community needs this information. Um, we considered putting together a um, community guide to making substantial improvements, substantial damage determinations. Um, that's still a possibility, but um, really your um, source is the substantial improvement substantial damage desk reference that FEMA has put together. Um, you know, I use this all the time. Um, rather than me putting together a guide that pretty much takes what's in here into another guidance document, um, we feel that that is really the source that community officials should be looking at because it ha really has all the information that you need to help make that determination. So again, I we put together the cost estimate of any reconstruction or improvements. It's just to help guide the conversation about what things should be covered. Um, so it's included in that packet. So what costs should be included? In general, it's the cost associated with, with the repair of the building. Um, it must include costs even when they're donated or discount. Um, this is a case, especially with substantial damage, especially with a large event. You'll see um, there's groups that will come in and donate materials or they'll discount materials. Um, but in, in, in to ensure fairness, um, you, you really need to account for the actual or estimated cost of such materials. So if they even if it's discounted, you really should be looking at what the full cost of that uh, material is in making that determination. It's the same about labor um, with a especially a large scale event, you'll have volunteer organizations come in and offer to help people to rebuild. Um, but you need to account for that labor. It's also if somebody is handy and can do it themselves. You need to account for that labor because the people who um, can't do it themselves, um, you know, it's just it's it's fair to account for the labor as is. So you really need to account for that donate um, self-done or volunteer labor at normal market value or other going rate per labor. Um, the one thing to note is um, after significant significant events, the labor rates can be changed. Um, so sh that should be taken into account as well when you're looking at um, determining that labor rate. So the cost so the cost should be calculated for the full repair to the building before the damage condition condition. Um, this is a case when sometimes um, a structure is damaged and the property owner just either doesn't want to um, have some financial implications of not being able to do all of the prayers that they need to do as a result of the damage. Unfortunately, you need to account for all of those repairs, whether or not the owner is planning to do them now or, or later. You need to account for that when you're making your substantial damage determination because you really need to be looking at that whole picture of how to bring that structure back um, into place to its pre-damage con um, condition. Uh, I should also mention that the last bullet is the cost of any improvements. So sometimes um, structures are damaged 
And so since somebody is planning to do these repairs, they may like, oh, well, maybe, uh, you know, that improvement that I've been always wanting to do, since I'm already doing all these other repairs, maybe I'll add that in too. So you'll need to make sure that you account for those, any additional improvements, not just the repairs, but do they plan to do something else in addition to the structure? Those costs will need to be accounted for as well. Uh, so what costs should not be included? Costs not directly associated with the building, um, such as landscaping, um, permits, permit fees are not generally um, included. Any cost required to correct a documented existing violation um, are things that would not be included. So just like substantial improvement, substantial damage, um, you know, the cost to be included, um, there's a whole list. Like I said, this desk reference has a very detailed list. It doesn't account for everything, but it accounts for a lot of things, and it'll give you an idea of things that need to be included. Costs that, be, that can be excluded are also in that desk reference. Um, like I said, there are some fees that can, are not included. Um, Plug-in appliances are not included. So there's just be aware of those items that can be included and not, um, not included. So this slide is just to give you a uh, quick indication of when you may be looking at a substantial damage um, determination. There are five key elements of a structure and they make up about 60% of the structure. So if you see a lot of damage to these, um, these five items, chances are you're gonna end up with a substantial damage determination. So this is kind of just a, just a, like a thing to think about when you're out there looking at a damaged structure, you know, how does the foundation look? If the foundation is is blown out, if it's um, collapsed, you know, um, the superstructure, interior, doors, windows, plumbing, you know, kind of what are those conditions? Um, and that can help. You still need to go through the process of determination, but this can be a quick, quick guide for an assessment. As I said before, market value of the structure really shouldn't be no, you really should know ahead of time, especially with substantial improvement potentially happening um, frequently with people improving structures, um, just knowing what market value are you going to be using throughout the community. Um, again, New Hampshire uses assessed value typically for the assessed value of just the structure. Um, there have been cases where a property owner is in a disagreement with the assessed value of the structure. So there's always the option that they can provide more detailed information with. They can hire a licensed property appraiser to submit something. Um, you as the community official can review that. Um, and then maybe you talk to your, assessed, your assessor or this, somebody in the assessing department um, to see, you know, whether or not um, this is a reasonable um, amount. Um, you as the community still have the last say in what the mark, what you feel the market value of the structure is gonna be. So when you have your total cost of repairs, when you have that pre-damaged market value of the structure, you compare that, does it equal or exceed 50%? Is it less than 50%? Um, and that determination will determine what the next steps are. So FEMA has what they call a substantial damage estimator tool. Um, it's a free software um, that's available to help community officials make substantial damage determinations um, after a natural disaster. It allows communities to um, input information right into that tool and it will help make those determinations for you. Um, it's really advised that you do a lot of the pre-populating um, in the tool itself before you um, are dealing with the substantial damage determination, so you are ready to go. Um, so that's a best practice recommendation with the tool. So it uses the concept of damage estimates for individual structure elements, and it makes that determination of substantial damage. It includes assessment options for residential structures and common non-residential structures. Um, I believe at the end, um, Samara is going to uh, mention um, there is an online training on how to use this tool. Um, so if you are interested in, I advise um, looking into that online um, 
online course that will kind of walk you through of how the estimator works. So as best practice um, and for your um, record keeping, um, you really need to be documenting what your determination is, whether or not it is a substantial damage or not substantial damage. Um, it's good to document whichever way you're going um, with a letter to the property owner and to have a copy in your file. Um, there are sample letters in that substantial um, improvement, substantial damage desk reference that I showed. Um, so it's kind of all set up and ready to go for you there. As we mentioned before, substantial improvement determinations and um, determinations um, can go to the zoning board it, um, if someone's seeking uh, a variance from an administrative decision. Um, that is a possibility that can go there. So if you do determine that a structure has been substantially damaged, it has to be brought into compliance just as if substantial improvement has to be brought into compliance with the ordinance as if it was new construction. So if you have, so that lowest floor um, has to be at or above base elevation, depending on what your ordinance says. Some communities require that lowest floor to be two feet above base foot elevation. Um, if you have a lowest floor that's below that um, and it's substantially damaged, it will need to be raised up um, and brought into compliance. Um, basements are not allowed. We have a lot of basements um, here in New Hampshire and New England, so um, that's a factor that needs to be considered. Um, if they are substantially damaged, they're looking at having to fill that up to grade um, and getting that lowest floor up. Um, making sure those enclosure requirements are being met, those utilities are being elevated, and any any materials below that flood level need to be of flood damage resistant materials. Um, different requirements if you're in zone A versus zone A, zone B, um, so just be aware of those. So say you go through the determination and um, it results in less than 50%. It's not considered a substantial damage. It does not meet, need to meet the ordinance requirements for new construction. Um, there may be other requirements that may apply, especially if you have a structure that's in a floodway or if there's other factors that are involved that the ordinance may apply to. You just need to be aware of that. But as far as the building itself, it would need to it would not need to, need to meet those ordinance requirements. Um, There's certainly a lot of guidance out there about voluntary mitigation measures that uh, property owners can do to a structure to help further protect that structure without having to meet the standards of the ordinance. So there's a lot of information out there about that. These are two, um, two of those uh, death re reference guides that kind of help with um, further protecting structures. Um, and after a substantial damage determination, you issue the permit, you really need to follow through and make sure that whatever they're doing is in compliance with your ordinance, that they are meeting that lowest floor elevation, um, making sure that along the way they don't find that they have additional costs along the way, because if they have additional costs, you need to come back and um, figure this, figure it out, especially if you've determined it's especially true for those that you've determined not to be a substantial damage. They go, they go out and they repair and they find that there's more work that needs to be done. They really need to come back to the community and have those costs accounted for in the substantial damage determination that was originally done. Um, it can, if, if things aren't followed through, um, it can hurt the property owner with their flood insurance. Um, when a flood in insurance adjuster comes out, they may be saying, well, it's, just, it's the amount of damage that's been done is looking like substantial damage. They may probably will refer them to talk to the town. Um, if the town isn't enforcing it and we find, you know, we find that there's, a, there's an issue, um, Ultimately, community as participation, you can lose your participation in the NFIP. Um, generally, we try not to get there and we're available to help communities, but just be aware um, that that is a factor as well. 
As I keep repeating, um, maintaining documentation is the key, um, and not only for liability purposes for the community, but just to maintain your good standing in the National Flood Insurance Program. So again, you need to have your determination calculation information, um, your letters, um, if there's a historic structure that's been excluded from the substantial improvement or substantial damage, there needs to be documentation on that as well. Um, you need to keep as-built elevation if, if a structure has been substantially damaged or improved, um, and they need to build in compliance with the as if it was new construction, you need to have that as-built elevation for that finished construction. Certainly, if there's any variances, um, you need to have that on file and just any other documentation. If you acquire the elevation certificate, you need to maintain that on file as well. And just as we talked about in substantial improvements, the key is just being consistent and fair among all applicants. Um, it's good to have written procedures. Um, I can say probably a lot of communities had officials that were in at their community in 2007 that were dealing with the substantial damage uh, determinations that happened as a result of the big floods that we had in southern New Hampshire. Um, you know, they may not be around with the, at the community anymore, so you've kind of lost that um, knowledge and that history of how things were done in the past. So, as I keep saying, you know, have written procedures down, because if you have a community official that leaves that and the next person can just pick up to where they left off and that makes sure that you still have a consistent process um, on how to deal with substantial improvement and substantial damage. Just having a knowledge of what market value you're going to be using for every substantial improvement, substantial damage, and just implementing your procedures on how to deal with all of them. And again, document and maintain files. Um, all of these are good best practices and help um, keep your community in good standing with the NFIP. All right, so this is a flow chart that we showed before. It's in the substantial improvement, substantial desk reference. It kind of walks you through that process of determining the cost, determining that cost value. Is it 50% or not 50% in which direction you kind of go. Um, so this is a good flow chart just to have, just to remind you of kind of the process that you go through. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Samara, who will talk more about preparing for those large scale events and how to deal with them. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. So as Jennifer talked about earlier on, uh, your approach to making substantial damage determinations is probably going to vary depending on if there's only one structure involved or there's a couple versus if there's a large scale disaster and there are many damaged buildings in your community that are located in the special flood hazard area. So this section is about tips and best practices that can help you in this post-disaster environment make those SD determinations. So anyone who has experienced a, a large-scale disaster, either as a community official or just as a human being, knows that it's a really stressful environment. And people who live in communities affected by a disaster, they really want to just get back to normal. You know, they want to start rebuilding as soon as possible. That's, that's completely understandable. But unfortunately, because of that, they may attempt to disregard the need for permits. They're almost certainly not going to be aware that a an SD determination needs to be made if they're located in a special flood hazard area. So that presents a challenge to you as community officials after a disaster. So what can you do to, to help mitigate that, that problem? Advanced preparations are highly recommended. They can really reduce 
your stress level because they can reduce the amount of work that will need to be done after the disaster. And they can help ensure that your permit process runs smoothly and that the SD determinations are made quickly, consistently, and fairly in your community. So to that end, one thing you can do, like Jennifer was talking about, having procedures in place for how your permit process and your SD determination process is going to work is, is a really good thing to do. And that, that applies not just like in a post-disaster environment, but also just in, you know, whatever you want to call it, peacetime, sunny day times as well. But you want to make sure that you have specific procedures that apply post-disaster because again that process your permit process is going to look different depending on if you're recovering from a disaster or if you're just you know sunny day times so some of the things that you could include in those procedures that that you would want to include in those procedures would be specific community responsibilities, staffing wise, who's going to be helping with these different tasks that need to be done, details about how your determinations are going to be made, if there's available data sources that you can pull from, what are they, and uh, the steps to take if a building has been determined to be substantially damaged what happens next how are you going to issue the determinations how are you going to ensure enforcement with your community's ordinance so let's take a closer look at some of these these different items here for staffing you just you want to document who actually is going to be handling the permitting process who's going to be making the sd determinations are there is there overflow staff that you can that you can get to help you if there's a lot of buildings damaged? You know, um, having a mutual aid agreement is a really good thing. In New Hampshire, there is a public works mutual aid program. So that's something you might want to consider if you don't already have one of those in place. I'm sure other states have similar types of mutual aid programs as well. And also be thinking about how those, those additional staff will be trained. There are a lot of resources out there. Jennifer mentioned uh, training available for the Substantial Damage Estimator tool that's um, available online. We have links to that at the end. There are a lot of other guidance documents that will, that will um, point you to it at the end as well. And just having a really detailed procedures document in itself is a really helpful thing to help staff understand how this process is going to work. Outreach to your residents, again, like Jennifer was talking about earlier, is going to be really important because you want to make sure that residents understand the need for the SD determinations and the need for permits as quickly as possible after the disaster because again they're they're going to want to start rebuilding as soon as possible in a lot of cases and you want to make sure you get to them before that happens another important thing is to make sure that other officials in your community are aware of the requirements too so that everyone's on the same page they can also help educate people when they're talking to residents as well. So there are a lot of options when it comes to actually communicating that information to residents, uh, different channels. It, it varies depending on how you normally communicate with your residents. If you have if you're on social media, if you, your community has a website, which most of them do these days, but not all. Those are really good ways to get the word out, but definitely consider multiple channels because not everyone is on social media. Not everyone looks on, on your website. In some cases, just US mail may be an option. 
or door to door handouts like on on doorknobs, something like that. Post disaster recovery meetings in your community when they happen as well uh, would be another good way to get that information out to people. So just be thinking about those different different channels that you can use to reach your residents. If you can, gathering data ahead of time that can help you make the, the SD determinations is a really, really effective way to, to get, get the determinations done quickly and efficiently. For communities that have digital, digitally produced flood maps, and I, I know not every community on this call has them, but if you do, and you have digital parcel data, it's actually a pretty simple GIS operation to create a list of buildings located in a special flood hazard area. And having that list can be really helpful when, when you're going out and trying to figure out which, which buildings in your community need to actually have the determinations. And it can also serve as, you can just check uh, check each property off as you're going through your list and making determinations to make sure you're you're getting everyone who needs to have a determination made. Also pre-identifying the source of information used for market value or um, uh, cost estimates can be really helpful as well. If you have the ability to, if you, you're able to get that list of properties, joining that information to, to that list is, is really, that's kind of the, the gold standard you want to strive for if you have the ability to do that. I'll just say for New Hampshire communities, if, if this is something you're interested in, getting a list of buildings located in the special flood hazard area and you don't have GIS capabilities, get in touch with us because we may be able to help on that end because again it's fair it's a fairly simple process we have access to gis tools here as well so just be thinking about that like jennifer mentioned before the fema substantial damage estimator tool can be pre-populated ahead of time so if you're interested in using that tool definitely check out some training and see how you can do that If your community has the available staff, it's definitely recommended uh, to perform door-to-door -door inspections to assess damage as soon as safely possible. Then you can use that those damage assessments to estimate repair costs either using that, that FEMA SDE tool or some other method. The first step, if you do do this, is to define the substantial damage inventory area. So the area that, that you will need to inspect. And that would basically be areas of your community that are located in the special flood hazard area that have sustained damage during the disaster. So again, having, having a map available or using GIS tools can be really G GIS tools especially can be really helpful in, in um, developing maps that inspectors can use in the field. Before you spent, send whoever is going out inspecting properties out into the field, you want to make sure that you're all on the same page and how you're going to be uh, estimating damage. Having having a common checklist that everyone uses is is definitely recommended. Make sure everyone is aware of your access protocol. So what what is going to happen if nobody's home at a particular building? Are you going to to come back later? Are you going to leave a little like a door hanger or something, letting people know to to contact you to to schedule a a visit? Are you going to go inside the building if nobody is home? Those are things you really need to figure out ahead of time so that, that everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. After a disaster, there's still hazards around, so you need to be 
very careful and make sure everyone is aware of safety procedures and is will follow them. Also, it's a good practice to notify law enforcement in the area of your proposed inspection schedule so that they're they're in the loop as well. I mentioned outreach before. That is really definitely a good thing to let people know that you're going to be out inspecting the damaged area so they know ahead of time that that you will be out there uh, knocking on their door after disasters you know a lot of people are maybe knocking on the door they could be scam artists uh, shady contractors whoever so you want to make sure that that they know who you are and that that your inspectors have official identification that they can show to people so that they're comfortable letting them look around their, their property. When it comes time to assessing the damage, again, having maps that the inspectors can use that include the SFHA boundaries and also a list of properties that they'll, they'll need to inspect, inspect if there's damage is ideal. Again, for communities that have digitally produced flood maps, there are applications that you could use, say, on an iPad um, to view to view the maps online if there's service available, so that may be an option as well. Again, using a checklist tailored to com your community to assess the different types of damage that may have occurred will be useful or also using the SDE tool. Taking photos of the damage is really, really important so that if you need to go back and, and look at, look at the um, assessed damage, the report of that, then you have the, those photos to confirm what it was that you saw. Uh, be, be cognizant of that structures may be unsafe to enter and may require emergency permits. So if, if you encounter those, you want to, to flag those. And of course, don't go, don't go in those until they're safe, safe to enter, again, following safety protocols. When it comes time to making the SD determinations, again, make sure your determinations are defensible consistency is really important and again that's why something like the SDE tool can be useful if you uh, if you have a lot of a lot of uh, buildings to assess pay special attention to determinations that uh, once you make them they end up close to the SD threshold like between 40 and 60 percent um, as opposed to the ones that are like definitely have very little damage or they're just a complete loss because the ones in between are the ones where there could be some uh, the the property owners may be may contest that and you want to make sure again that they are defensible something to be aware of uh, property owners may have an incentive to show less damage than actually occurred or to show more damage depending on what uh, they what they want to do. For example, they may they may want to show less damage to avoid the cost of bringing the building into compliance with the ordinance, which could be it could be costly. Or they want to they may want to show more damage than actually occurred for insurance or grant purposes. And I'll talk more about um, that later on. So just be aware that that it could be either way. One approach you might want to take when it comes to issuing the ter determinations is to consider issuing letters with a preliminary determination first and then request that the property owner meet with you to get their permit and to re receive the final determination. That way, if the property owner provides a detailed cost estimate of the repairs, um, and that indicates that the preliminary determination should be changed, 
then you can change it. Having a meeting like this is also helpful because it gives you an opportunity to review with the property owner the specific ordinance requirements that will apply, answer questions about them, and um, an opportunity to provide guidance documents, for example. Um, Jennifer was talking a lot about uh, some of those different documents that apply for different aspects of your ordinance, um, and they could be useful for the property owner as they're, as they're rebuilding. Okay, so let's talk about how substantial damage determinations are connected with FEMA grants and flood insurance. Increased cost of compliance coverage, also known as ICC. Um, these are additional funds available for property owners that have an NFIP flood insurance policy after a flood. In order to be eligible for these funds, the structure must be located in a special flood hazard area and either meet the criteria of a repetitive loss structure, I'll talk more about what that is later on, or be substantially damaged due to flooding. Note that this, is, this only applies to flood damage, whereas the substantial damage definition is more broad and includes, can include damage from any source, but to get these funds, it needs to be from fl flooding. So to be eligible um, from the standpoint of substantial damage, a copy of the commu your community substantial damage determination letter would be required. Uh, the property owner would need to uh, provide that to their insurance company in order to receive these funds. So close coordination between the community and the property owner is often involved when um, when it comes to ICC, and this is a, a common source of funding after a, a flood disaster. For this reason, FEMA has actually developed a, a guidance document that you see the cover of here uh, that's spe specifically targeted to state and local officials about ICC that um, provides more information than you'll probably ever want <laughs> about this topic and the community's role um, in this process. So ICC, again, this is, this is a flood insurance claim. It's not a grant. It's a special type of claim that um, can be used to bring a building, um, to bring it into compliance with the community floodplain ordinance. So it could be used to elevate a building to the appropriate elevation to um, demolish or rebuild the house to, uh, to that is in compliance with your ordinance requirements. You could relocate a building. If it's a non-residential structure, uh, you could use the funds to floodproof the building. It's the funding provided, it's up to $30,000. So that may not be enough to cover the full cost of bringing the building into compliance. But what it can be done is that the, these funds can be assigned to a community by the property owner to serve as a cost share match for a FEMA hazard mitigation grant project that could include the additional funds to bring that building into compliance. So they can be, so these funds can be used together with hazard mis mitigation grant funds. And speaking of hazard mitigation grants, there is actually another separate connection with substantial damage for property acquisition projects that are funded under the different hazard mitigation grants that you see listed here. There's actually an expedited cost benefit analysis process that applies if the structure has been substantially damaged and is located in a riverine special flood hazard area on a preliminary or effective flood map. So that, that can be a great help and uh, definitely save some time and effort if you don't have to perform that, that 
benefit cost analysis. Another connection with uh, FEMA grants is this is a new one. So with the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, abbreviated to DRRA, there's a, a specific part of this act that allows communities to apply for public assistance grant funds to, to administer and enforce their floodplain ordinance after a major disaster declaration. So that includes reimbursement for making substantial damage determinations, hiring and training staff to perform determinations or other aspects of your permit process. And there's a complete list of reimbursable activities in FEMA's policy document that they released last year. And we have a link to that at the end of the presentation as well. So you have that information. Okay, let's talk a bit about how communities can go beyond minimum NFIP requirements in relation to SD. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the SISD provisions are the only ones in your floodplain ordinance that will really reduce risk to existing structures. So if you adopt by adopting higher standards, you can make these provisions even more effective and increase your community's resilience to, to floods. So let's take a look at a, a few of these. During the, the substantial improvement webinar, we talked about cumul cumulative, cumulative substantial improvement. So there's a similar cumulative substantial damage, the same concept where your community can adopt in an ordinance with updated language that captures repairs over a particular time frame rather than repairs from, from just one event. So for example, you could have a, a building could have been damaged in one event, like say within like 10 years, and it didn't meet the 50% the threshold at that time, say it was 23%. Um, of the market value of the the building, the cost of the the repair, and then it was damaged a couple years later. Having a cumulative provision allows you to capture the total repair costs from both of those events, and then if if they reach that 50% threshold, then they would need to bring the building into compliance. Um, whereas if you didn't have that provision, then it would just you would just be considering one one instance of of damage and repair. Again, it's really important to have detailed procedures on how you're going to be tracking the the damage uh, cumulatively. So be thinking about that if this is something you're interested in doing, and I would definitely recommend talking to your state's NFIP coordinator at in New Hampshire, that's us, um, if you're interested in doing this. For communities that participate in the community rating system, there is credit for this activity in addition to cumulative SI as well. And then again, similar to substantial improvement, you can also adopt a lower threshold for substantial damage, whereas, uh, so, you could just instead of having 50% as the threshold, you could have 40% or 30%, something lower than that, so that a, a lesser amount of damage would trigger the provision to bring the building into compliance with your ordinance. Again, there is credit for this for uh, CRS communities, but this is this is less than you would receive for a cumulative provision. Wanted to circle back to ICC, the increased cost of compliance funds, and how this relates to higher SD standards, the ones I just talked about. ICC funds, again, if a building is substantially damaged, then it, due to flooding, it would be eligible for these funds. But if you adopted a cumulative substantial damage clause, 
or a lower threshold, then the funds would only be available if it met the, the NFIP standard requirement. So for example, if you had a lower threshold of 40% for your SD in your ordinance and a building was damaged and it it came in at 43%. So by your uh, the definition in your ordinance, this would be substantial damage and it would need to be brought into compliance with your ordinance. But for the purposes of ICC, since it didn't meet the 50% threshold, it would not be eligible for those funds. So um, one thing that you could do, you could add what's called a repetitive loss provision into your ordinance, where if um, a repetitive loss structure, meaning and there's a very specific definition that is on this slide here where a, a building has sustained damage on two separate occasions during a 10-year period where the cost of repairs um, on average equals or exceeds 25 percent of the market value of the structure if you have such a provision in your ordinance then there would th there would be another way that a building would be eligible for icc even if it didn't meet the, the um, SD definition. So there's more information about that in that um, ICC guidance document uh, if you're interested in, in adding such a provision. And again, you can always talk to us or your state's NFIP coordinator for more information about that as well. One more thing related to CRS. There is actually a newly creditable activity related to substantial damage. This was just added in January for developing a substantial damage management plan. And so such a plan would contain some of the information I was talking about earlier on about like your process for uh, making substantial damage determinations. So you can receive up to 140 points. And there is actually a guidebook and a plan template coming soon from, from uh, FEMA and ISO. So look for that. That may be something you're interested in. And also, even if your community is not in CRS, these are tools that you, you may want to take a look at, the guidebook and the plan template. You don't have to be in CRS to use those. So once they're available, we'll, um, we'll put those on our website so that, that you have access to them. Um, and do check those out. I believe they should be released pretty soon. So hopefully, hopefully we'll hear about that when that's actually going to happen soon. Okay, so let's just talk about a few resources here and then we'll wrap up and have some time for questions. So uh, we, we've been talking about the substantial improvement, substantial damage desk reference. Jennifer pointed that out earlier on. This is definitely uh, a really great resource for more information on, on pretty much any, any topic related to SISD. There's also answers to questions about substantially improved, substantially damaged buildings. This, that was recently updated. So, so check that one out too. There's the substantial damage estimator tool available for download online for free. And there's also a lot of good documentation about how to use that as well. The uh, DRA section 1206 about uh, communities getting reimbursed after a flood, does not a, any disaster related to substantial damage and other aspects of your your permitting process that's uh, the link to the policy guidance on that the icc guidance document i mentioned and also the 2021 addendum to the crs coordinators manual which includes information on um on that new sd management plan activity for New Hampshire, we actually, um, our substantial damage page just went live um, a couple of minutes ago, I believe. So uh, that's a good resource. And that, that page actually has the um, slide, 
the presentation slides, I'll send a link out that to everyone so that they have that. The New Hampshire Flood Hazards Handbook for Community Officials. This is a document that was created by our state's Silver Jackets team, which is a multi-agency team devoted to reducing flood risk in the state. This is uh, this includes information about a lot of topics related to preparing for and responding to flood disasters, and it does include a section on flood floodplain management permitting and substantial damage determinations as well. So do check that out. And that also contains a lot of other great information from other agencies, including um, information about FEMA grants, state assistance available, and a lot more. And there is more training coming up as well. Uh, FEMA and ISO are ho holding a webinar about CRS and that new substantial damage management plan on May, May 19th. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Also, FEMA's Emergency Management Institute has a couple of web courses. That, again, these are all free about using that substantial damage estimator tool and a more general substantial damage estimation for floodplain administrators, which I think includes um, a fair amount of information on um, the SDE tool as well. So do check those out. I've included our contact information here. I think you should all have my contact information by now since I, I've been keep sending you things, um, but you have that and for those of you in different states, I've listed here the state NFIP coordinator for each one in case you're in case you don't have that information.